الحمد لله رب العالمين وبه نستعين على أمور الدنيا والدين وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد خاتم النبيين وآله وصحبه أجمعين ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله. Today continuing with كتاب الإيمان من صحيح البخاري. Today's chapter that we begin with, inshallah, actually, I thought we were going to do, I don't know, I thought something other than, I was reading earlier, or I was reviewing earlier from the hadith of Jibreel, that's in this chapter, and I thought we were there, so I was preparing for that, but we're not there, we're actually further back, so I don't know. So, alhamdulillah, no problem. We still have more work to do, that means, right? Thought we were almost done for a second. Babu Ziyadat al Imani wa Nuqsanihi. The chapter of the increase of Iman and its decrease. The chapter of the increase of Iman and its decrease. You have the, um, here, let me just read it for you. Read it first. Uh, 33, no, you. Babu Ziyadat al Imas on the bottom of it, you see it? Yeah. God, Bismillah. <clears throat> Faith increases and decreases. In the statement of Allah, we increase them in guidance. And the believers may increase in faith. And Allah Ta'ala said, This day I have perfected your religion for you. The statement indicates that if somebody leaves a part of the perfection of the religion, then his religion is incomplete. Barakallahu feekum. Tayyip. So this chapter heading, the chapter headings of Imam al-Bukhari, they're called Tarjumah. They call his chapter headings, his, the, the, what he says in his bab, Tarjumah. And, that, and what they do is they introduce what he's going to bring as for the ahadith. So when we learn and pay attention to the fiqh of the Tarjumah of Imam al-Bukhari that he uses in his bab, then you learn what he means or what he intends by utilizing that hadith that's going to come, or those ayat. So these ayat that he mentioned here so far are under the title of Iman increases and decreases. And we understand that from the beginning of the book, the beginning of this chapter. The increase and the decrease of Iman. And that is very important. That we understand that Iman increases and we understand that it decreases. Once you understand that it increases, you understand that it decreases, so that makes you do what? You want to pay attention to what makes it decrease, right? You want to pay attention to what makes it decrease so that you prepare and protect yourself from allowing your iman to decrease, right? Very important. So he says, Allah Ta'ala was in Nahum Huda, and we increase them in guidance. Who are they? Who's being discussed here? This is from Surah Al Kaf. This ayah is from Surah Al Kaf. Wallahu Ta'ala says, Innahum fitisun amanu bi rabbihim wa zidnahum huda. A brief reminder about something from Surah Al-Kahf for us, right? For us young people, us shabab. No one here is over 40, right? Everyone's a bunch of young people, alhamdulillah. That one of the things that was special about the people of the Kah, about Ashab al-Kahf was that they weren't poor people, they were rich people, right? And Allah says what? إِنَّهُمْ فِتْيَةٌ آمَنُوا بِرَبِّهِمْ وَزِدْنَاهُمْ هُدَىٰ so they did what first? They believed in Allah. They have believed in Allah, and their belief made them want to do certain actions. Right? Was it nahum huda? And Allah said, we increased them in guidance, which is iman. So we learn from this what? That if we want to be protected, we want to be upon firmness, then the first thing we have to do is what? Believe. believe. And Allah will strengthen us once we start to act in accordance to our belief. Allah will aid and assist us. We have to believe. And that's a very important thing to realize in today's time that we have to be willing to sacrifice for our belief as well. These rich, young, aristocratic children, or not even as children, but they were not. They were older, like, you know, Shabbat. They weren't over 40, but they weren't babies either. They sacrificed the good life that they had to go live in a cave. They sacrificed their palace life. Some, one of them was the, was the son of the, of the, of the ruler. 
So he sacrificed his good life to go live in a what? Cave. All for the sake of what? Protecting and preserving his or his iman. And there were women with them. Did you know that? Did you ladies know that? There was a lady with them. So they ran to save their deen. What are we willing to do to save our deen? What are we willing to do to save our deen? Anyway. And then the Shaykh he says after that, وَقَالَ الْيَوْمَ أَكْمَلْتُ لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ oh, He says, وَيَزْدَادَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِيمَانًا Allah Ta'ala recites in the Quran, it mentions in the Quran, وَإِذَا تُلِيَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُ زَادَتْهُمْ إِيمَانًا that those who those who when the ayat of Allah are recited upon them, it increases them in iman. When Allah Ta'ala mentions also his dad Ladina Amanu Imana, when he says, That when that which came in their previous books conformed with which is in the Quran, it increased them in Iman. It increased them in Iman. And then Allah Ta'ala mentions, That this day I perfected your religion for you. So the Shaykh, he says, that if something is left off from being complete, then it is deficient. So Allah Ta'ala says that he completed, akmaltu, he means complete, that means that there's some people's deen that might not be complete. There's some people's deen that might be naqis and deficient. May Allah protect us from being of any of those types. We start with the first hadith in this chapter. So the Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah Ta'ala, he says, حدثنا مسلم بن إبراهيم قال حدثنا هشام قال حدثنا قتادة عن أنس رضي الله عنه عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال يخرج من النار من قال لا إله إلا الله وفي قلبه وزن الشعيرة من خير ويخرج من النار من قال لا إله إلا الله وفي قلبه وزن برة من خير وَيَخْرُجُ مِنَ النَّارِ مَنْ قَالَ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَفِي قَلْبِهِ وَزْنُ ذُرَّةٍ مِنْ خَيْرٍ قال أبو عبد الله قال أبان حدثنا قتالة حدثنا أنس عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم من إيمان مكان من خير طيب So this hadith on authority of Anas who remembers who Anas is? Who is Anas? Who? Who is he? Who's Anas? Who was Anas to the Prophet No. No. Huh? No, he wasn't a slave. No. Anas ibn Malik, radiallahu anhu, was the servant of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Not a slave, where he was a... Anas ibn Malik was a free person. He wasn't a slave. But his mother came and gave him to serve to of the I mean gave him to serve the Prophet Sallallahu so they can learn from him and so on and so forth. So Anas ibn Malik Khadim al Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was the servant of the Prophet. He said that the Prophet said, Yahruju min an they will come out from the fire, whoever has said, La ilaha illallah. They will come out from the fire. They will come out from the fire, whoever has said, La ilaha illallah. And in his heart is the weight of of barley, men of good, from good. And in one narration it says, from Iman. The weight of a barley seed from Iman. And it will be expelled or taken out from the fire, whoever has the weight of, of wheat, of good, of wheat of goodness or from Iman in his heart. And it will be expelled from the fire whoever said La ilaha illallah wa fi qalbihi waznu dharwatin min khayr. And whoever has even the smallest ant size worth of Iman in his heart will be brought out from the fire. 
in one narration it mentions from good, and another narration it mentions from Iman. Now, the important thing to mention here is not that, as some people errone erroneously say, that long as I have even a little bit of Iman, I won't stay in the fire forever. Long as I have even an atom's worth of good, a dharra worth of good in my heart, or burwa worth of good in my heart, or sha'ira worth of good in my heart, this is a very small weight, obviously. Some people, they find hope in this, right? They say, I'll be okay, I'll be safe. Yes, it's something to have hope in, but we should not want to touch the fire at all. Not even for a second. Not even for a second do we want to touch the fire of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't want to touch it. So we have to work hard to increase our iman so that we don't just have dharra min iman in our hearts. Or we don't have just sha'ira min iman in our hearts. Or burra min iman from our hearts. That our hearts are full of love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're full of iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we don't have to touch the fire at all by the permission and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The next narration that we have in Yes. Is this a hadith for people who get desperate? Is this a hadith for people who get desperate? Tell them to be quiet upstairs, please. Wait, no, can you tell them? Oh, they're leaving? Oh, okay. They were depressed. Would it help them in a little bit? I don't know. I don't know. Because that, I mean, touching the fire in itself is depressing. So, I mean, the, the, the narrations that, that are there for that, you know, we, we hear, well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, la rahmatillah, right? Qul ya ibadil ladhina asrafu ala anfusihim, la taqmatum rahmatillah. Say to my servants who have wronged themselves, don't ever despair in the mercy of Allah. We don't want to think about touching the fire in reality. And remember, why was the fire? Remember the hadith we talked about yesterday? The fire right? The fire complained to his Lord, subhanahu wa ta'ala. The fire is so hot it complained, right? That part of it is eating part of it. The fire is a serious situation. It's a serious situation. That Jibreel, uh, alayhi salatu wasalam, he said when he saw it, he said that I fear that whoever here, whoever see, here, no, he said that whoever sees of this, or whoever sees of it will never want to enter it. It's that serious. It's a serious situation. He sought refuge in Allah. <coughs> so, Allah knows best if that's the situation. Right? <coughs> a person will find some type of, um, a person will find some type of, uh, happiness in that. We shouldn't want to be the person that has just a, you know, yes, I mean, it is a reminder of the importance of Iman. It's a reminder of the importance of La ilaha illallah. It's a reminder of how weighty La ilaha that the believer will never stay in the fire. Right? All that is important for sure. But we should not be the type of people who rely on just hope. The believer stands between what? Hope and fear. The believer stands between hope and fear. That's how the believer lives his life. That he has hope in the mercy of Allah, but he fears the punishment of Allah. They say it's like the two wings of a bird. If the bird has one wing, it doesn't fly properly. And some of the ulama, they ask the question, they say, should a person have more fear of Allah or more hope in Allah? That's a question. I'm going to ask you all the same question. Should a person have more fear of Allah or hope in Allah? You say hope, you say fear. What, is that? what do you guys say? Hope, fear. Fear? Fear, hope. And that's the same thing that happens. Everyone has a different opinion, right? So the reality is the ulama they say they bring between the two. They said that a person should have more hope in Allah, right? At this time of death, when they're dying, when they're on their deathbed, so they think good about Allah. They have personal fun. They have good thoughts about Allah in the time of their death. That Allah, Allah, hopefully Allah will accept the deeds that I did because I can't do nothing else now. So they have more hope at that time. But when they're living their life, when they're young, like all of you people, young, with energy, right? They should have more fear. So that they don't just do deeds, say, oh, Allah's going to forgive me, Allah's going to forgive me. No, you should have fear of that punishment of Allah. So it depends on where you're at in your life. It depends on where you're at in your life. When you're healthy, have more fear. When you're sick, have more hope. 
But aside from that, normally, you want to be balanced between the two, having hope and fear. Fear that Allah will not accept your deeds and hope that he will, out of his mercy, accept it from you. None of us, we don't want to touch that fire at all. The next hadith, حدثنا الحسن بن الصباح سمع جعفر بن عون حدثنا أبو العميس أخبرنا قيس بن مسلم عن طارق بن شهاب عن عمر بن الخطاب رضي الله عنه أن رجلا من اليهود قال له يا أمير المؤمنين آية في كتابكم تقرؤونها لو علينا معشر اليهود نزلت لاتخذنا ذلك اليوم عيدا قال أي آية؟ قال اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم واتممت عليكم نعمتي ورضيت لكم الإسلام دينا قال عمر رضي الله عنه قد عرفنا ذلك اليوم والمكان الذي والمكان الذي نزلت فيه على النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وهو قائم بعرفة يوم الجمعة Uh, there comes an authority, this narration is on the authority of Umar radiallahu anhu. This is a statement of Umar. It's an incident that happened with Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. He said, a man from the Yahud, a Jewish guy came to me, and he said, oh, leader of the believers, ya amir al-mu'mineen. Umar radiallahu anhu was the first person to be called amir al-mu'mineen. Umar radiallahu anhu was the first one to be called amir al-mu'mineen. Well, you know, as it happened, Abu Bakr was called Khalifa to Rasul, right? He was the Khalifa of the Messenger of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Somebody would have been called Khalifa to Abu Bakr, the Khalifa. So, to keep it shorter, it was called Amir al-Mu'mineen. Amir al-Mu'mineen, the leader of the believers, right? came to Umar ibn al-Khattabi radiallahu anhu and he said to him, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen there is an ayah there is an ayah in your book that you all recite if it was revealed to us group of Jews we would have taken that as a, uh, that day that was revealed as an Eid as a day of celebration mind you the Jews said to him, right? we would have taken that as an Eid So Umar radiallahu anhu, he said to him, which ayah? He said, the ayah, اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم وأتممت عليكم نعمتي ورضيت لكم الإسلام الدين. So Umar radiallahu anhu, he responded, I know the place that it was revealed at. I know when it was revealed on Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he was standing at Arafah on Yom al-Jumu'ah. He was standing at Arafah on Yom al-Jumu'ah. So we have a few things to discuss here, right? Before we go into the hadith, I want to know who knows where, where what is Arafat? Who knows? What is Arafat? Arafat is But where is it? Where is Arafat? Huh? Where? Where? Yeah, basically, right? And it is the most important pillar of the Hajj, right? The Prophet says in the hadith, Al Hajju Arafat. That Hajj is Arafat. So it was revealed on a special, special day. What day of the month is Arafah? The ninth. The ninth day of what month? The ninth day of what month? Huh? Dhul Hijjah, of course. It's during Hajj. It's the ninth day of Dhul Hijjah, right? The day after that is what? Eid, Yom al right? 
Okay, alhamdulillah. We're all on the same page now, right? We got to know our days in Islamic month. Right? What day is after the, what day is after Yom al Huh? Ayyam al-Tashriq, right? We got to know our days. These are our holidays, right? If I say, when is Christmas? Everybody knows it's the 25th, right? If I say, right? So why do we don't know our days like this, right? So the Prophet was at one of the best places on the earth at the best time of the year, right? When this ayat was revealed. And not only that, it was a Jumu'ah. That was a special day on top of a special day on top of a special day. And these all are Eids. We don't need no Eids in our team, right? Jumu'ah is what? An Eid. Arafah is the day before our Eid, right? So this day was taken as an Eid for us, alhamdulillah. Already it was revealed on an Eid day. But now, what was the importance of this ayat? Allah says, this day I have perfected, completed your religion, your deen. For you. And I have perfected my favor upon you. And I am happy, I am pleased for you to have Islam as your way of life. We have to look at this ayah. Where is this, what surah is this ayah in? Surah al Ma'idah, right? So Allah he tells us. This day, that day Yom Al-Arafah, right? Jumu'ah. He said, I have completed my de the deen for you. It's done. There's nothing else that you have to worry about that's going to become from the deen of Allah. Right? Can you come with something today and make it Islam? They say this is a part of Islam. When 1,400 years ago, Allah, we sent the ayah down saying that the deen is complete. Huh? It's bid'ah, right? Yeah, it's bid'ah to bring something new. So Allah says that He completed the deen for us. How can you, how can I come now and say, I have something new? Or I want to do something that the Prophet Sallallahu didn't do. I want to do anything. Bid'ah happens in five ways. Let's say it like this first, right? Remember this. Bid'ah normally comes in five ways. Either it comes in the makan, the place. That's not where it's supposed to happen at. Can we make hajj around this fan? Tawaf around the fan? That would be bid'ah, right? That's not the place of tawaf. Is there any other place on the earth that we go around seven times to make tawaf? So if somebody decided to make tawaf around anything besides the Kaaba, that would be considered what? Bid'ah, right? Also, it comes in zaman, the time, right? Can I, in the month of Ramadan, go, or let's say in the month of Shawwal, go to Mecca, make tawaf, do sa'i wal marwa, uh, sa do, do, uh, go to Safa wal marwa, right? Make the sa'i. Then go to Muzdalifa and spend the night. Then go to Arafah, you know, and stand on Arafah, right? And make dua, and then go and stone the, uh, the Jamarat, right? For three days. And they come back and say, I made hajj. Why not? I did it. And I cut my hair too. Right? Can I do that? Why not? Huh? I went to Mecca, the right place. I did tawaf seven times. I did suffer marwa seven times between suffer and marwa. Right? I stayed at Musdalifa. I cut my hair after I made the tawaf of the Right? What did you say? The time is not right. Because Hajj is done in the time, the months of Hajj, right? So we have two so far. Bidah can be done in what? Place and time, right? Also, it comes in the amount. The amount of something, right? Can I go make Salat al Asr six raka'at? Why? Asr time is in. I'm praying to Allah. I raise my. Why can I not? The amount is not correct, right? Then, uh, then, 
it comes also in the Kephidia, how it's done. I'm supposed to pray towards the Kaaba, direction-wise. Can I pray towards Jerusalem still? It's bit out, right? That's not the direction that we're supposed to pray to. And then we have also the time, right? The Zaman means like the season, and walk means the actual time, like the walk of the day, right? Can I pray Salat and Fajr at Mother of Time? Can I pray Salat and Fajr at the time of Mother? We sure? That would be what? Yeah. So now, if it happens, something happens in one of these five categories that's not from Islam, that we don't have a text for, then we call it what? Bidah. So then is it okay for me to go to the grave of somebody and say, and make dua to them and say, help me? Well, you know, is that from our religion? Is that from our deen? Would it be okay for me to go and have a party and send salat upon the Prophet and say, ah, make different types of words and stuff? Sallallah, right? Make dignity like this? Is that okay? Why not? Huh? What am I violating? So many ways. One time, it's not the time that we're doing it, because we don't know nothing. There's nothing to say that we do this at that time. We don't know the prophet's birthday, right? The KP is completely wrong, right? The, just so many different, so many different levels is improper, right? So Allah completed our deen for us. We don't have to add anything else. And this is something that we, out of every other Sharia, should be pleased about. You know why? Why did the Jews say that he's going to be that he will take this as an Eid? Did any other Sharia before Islam get this type of stamp that your deen is complete, nothing else will ever come? No. We are the only deen, the only, the, our Prophet Sallallahu was the only one who had that stamp to say there's nothing else coming after. And we take that as a little thing. We take it as a small thing that nothing else is coming after. There's no other revelation coming down from the sky. There's no other extra way that we can get closer to Allah except by through the way of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's the reality what bid'ah means. Why do we say bid'ah is such a big deal? Because it means that you think that there's a way for you to get closer to Allah besides or other than the way that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came and brought. It's a big deal, right? That you think that the way that you found, or your shaykh, or this person came up with, that the Prophet never did, is better than the way that he came up. When Allah set a, steel, set a stamp, a seal of approval of the deen that Messenger Sallallahu died upon was the deen that he was pleased with. That he was pleased with that as our deen. Nothing else to be added. So how can we think that Allah is going to be happy with something new that our Messenger Sallallahu didn't bring already? a big deal. As well, what does this mean? What I'll to the Kumul Islam and Deen. There's some other stuff here that we need to be aware of. Deen is not just how we worship, right? It's not just Salat, Hajj. All that stuff came before in the other religions, right? Other religions, right? Hajj was since the time of Ibrahim, right? What about the salah? All the prophets and messengers made salah. Fasting, Allah said, Like the ones who came before you. So that's not nothing new. But our deen is also our way of life. The sunnah of the messenger, how he did things, how he married, how he ate, how he walked, how he talked. All of that is our deen. So Allah says he's pleased with that as our deen. So here we have a problem. We have a question. I have a question. If your culture, your urf, as we say, right, contradicts, clashes with something that's an affirmed practice in Islam, which one becomes more important? Your culture or Islam? Are we sure? Because Allah said he's pleased with the deen for us, right? Did he say Allah is pleased with your culture? Is Allah pleased with my African-American culture? I, whoa, whoa, whoa. Is Allah pleased with it? Do we have a stamp of approval saying Allah is pleased with that? That's Sheikh Shahid. No. Do, we, do you have a stamp of approval to say that Allah is pleased with your Tanzanian culture? No. No, no are you sure? No. Except maybe this is uh, 
accordance with the Islam. in accordance with Islam, right? What about you, uh, uh, Ridwan? Is Allah say that he was pleased with your Somali culture? You don't have nothing to say that. You sure? What about any of you over here? Does anyone have a stamp of approval to say Allah is pleased with it? What's our line? What's the line? When we say al orf muhkam, but what's the line? Oh, and if and if there's not a proof that it has to be denied, then the people's practice can always be applied. So does that mean that you don't have a culture? It means that you have a culture, and your culture can be applied as long as there's not a proof that it has to be denied, right? So Islam doesn't go against your culture, but your culture has to be based, or has to be weighed against Islam first. Because Allah said he's pleased with this, but we don't have that for our cultures. So we have to take our culture and weigh it with Islam first. Then if there's nothing contradicting it, then we can do it, right? Is it haram for you not to wear the big red Saudi ghutra? Do you have to do that? Is it haram for you to wear, for the lady to wear, other than black jilbab? Especially if her culture, the people, the women don't wear black. Is it haram? No, it's not haram. Is it haram for anything that comes? Is it haram for you to wear Nike Air Maxes? Huh? No, right? As long as it doesn't go against Islam. As long as it doesn't go against Islam. So remember that principle. We have to weigh our culture, our norms with Islam. And if it's not any proof that it has to be denied, write this, write this, write this principle down. This is a principle in Islam. And we, uh, the Shaykh, he made it into a poem for us to remember it like this, right? Shaykh Abu Tawbah, Hafidullah Ta'ala, he poemized, or he put it down in poetry, some of the kawa'id, the most important kawa'id of the fiqh. Just like the other ulama did in the past in Arabic and things of that nature, you put it in English. So the, the line of poetry goes for this urf, for urf, right? It's important for us to know this line. That what? If there's no proof, what is it? if there's no proof that the people's practice has to be denied, what is it? And if there's no proof that it has to be denied, then uh. people's practice can always be applied. If there's no proof that the, if the, if there's no proof, that it has to be denied, then the people's practice can always be applied. Write it down. If there's no proof that it has to be denied, then the people's practice can always be applied. If there's no proof that it has to be denied, then the people's practice can always be applied. That's important. And the opposite is just as well important. The opposite is just as well important. Why? Because if there is a proof that it has to be denied, we rest and deny it. No hits in our butts. Right? It's the culture of my people, right? Saturday night, they go to places that we don't want to talk about, right? They go and dance and... Do we do that? Shaq, can we go? It's my, it's my people's culture. Can we go? No. No. It's haram. Clear. So let's be clear about our deen outweighs our culture every time. Because Allah is pleased with us having Islam as our deen, but he never said he was pleased with our cultures yet. Okay? Tell you. So that's important that we understand this hadith. Chapter Babu Babun al Zakatu min al Islam. وقوله وما أمروا إلا ليعبدوا الله مخلصين له الدين حنفاء ويقيموا الصلاة ويؤتوا الزكاة وذلك دين القيمة The Shaykh, he starts the next chapter called with the title of chapter Az-Zakat You know Zakat, right? You know Zakat? Zakat is from Iman. Giving the Zakat is from the Iman. Paying the Zakat is from Iman. If you don't pay your Zakat, you're in trouble. If you don't pay your Zakat, you're in trouble. 
And he mentions the eye in the Quran where Allah says they were not ordered to do anything. To worship Allah sincerely, making their deen sincerely for Allah. That their deen, their worship is not for anyone besides Allah. It's not because of that's just what we do. It's not because my parents told me to do such. It's not because I, yeah, maybe I, I'll get married if I do it like that. Right? Some people. Right? People become Muslim to get married. So then, what happened? Uh, she was chasing a Muslim man, or the Muslim man was chasing a Muslim girl. I mean, the, the cat. And they get married for the sake of, they come to Muslim, become Muslim just to get married. So, we have to make our deen specifically for Allah alone. And to establish Hunafat, and we describe Hunafat to be the religion of Ibrahim, the way of Ibrahim, it means to turn away from everything else and to be going only to Allah, to be focused on Allah alone. Where you came with salah and to establish the salah, where you to zakat and to pay the zakat. And also Allah says, that is the upright deen. وَذَلِكَ دِينُ الْقَيِّمَ So, if we know that that's the upright deen, we know this is what we should be trying our best to apply, right? We should be trying our best to apply what? Making our deen, making us sincere, being sincere to Allah. And when we do it, we think about Allah. We bring it to mind that Allah is watching us. We bring it to mind and try to think like Allah, that we see Allah. And if we can't do that, at least we pay attention to the fact that Allah is watching us when we do it. If we can pay attention, that's not right, to the fact that Allah is watching us, right, when we do it, do you think that we'll be trying to show off? If we, we, will, we make a salat and we, Allah sees me. Does it matter if one is there? I could care less. Who's with me? We love him, right? But do we care, right? No, why? Because Allah is watching. How can I care that Munira is there when Allah is watching? Who cares, right? That's how we really have to be when it comes to this type of stuff. Our deen, it should be sincere to Allah. Who cares that Zubair is there? Right? Is that true? He's like, you better care. No, who cares? Because it, can Zubair give me reward on Yom Al-Qiyam? Can he keep me out of Jahannam? May Allah protect us all. Can he put me into Jannah? If the people that we're showing off for cannot do either of those two things, who cares, right? Who's the only one that can put you into Jannah and save you from the fire? Allah. So if you focus on the fact that Allah is watching me, who cares about anyone else? And that should be our life statement, right? That's my off the wall. That should be our life practice. It's not easy at times because we see the people, right? We see each other. But that's why it's such a high level that we have to get to the point where we can say, I'm not concerned about what the people are going to say or do long as I'm pleasing Allah. And I don't fear Lomata Latin. I don't fear the blame of anyone as long as I'm pleasing Allah. It's not easy, right? Is that an easy thing, anybody? But it's a level that we're supposed to be at. Right? As long as I'm pleasing Allah, who cares what they say about you? Oh, your thobe is short. MashaAllah, thank you. Why do you have that ugly beard? No, it's ugly to you, but <laughs> Allah loves it. Right? Why do you, why do you, whatever a person might say, who cares? We become so sensitive to everyone's opinion about us, and we're dissensitive to the opinion of Allah, to what Allah thinks about us, right? Especially when we live in these, like, uh, what are these things called? Communities, right? Right? When we live in small, knit communities, which is good, we should be worried about each other in that way, for bad or good, but it shouldn't stop us from doing good, right? My concern about my fellow Muslim should not stop me from doing good. If it stops me from doing good, if I fear the kalam or the statement of the people and I stop me from doing good, this can fall under shirk. This can fall under a type of shirk. Shirk al khawf. That when you fear the reprisal of people, oh, what if I do this? 
it can fall under a type of shirk that you have fear for other than Allah. We shouldn't be like that. We have to fill our hearts with the love of Allah, with the fear of Allah, with humility for the sake of Allah, and leave off worshiping the people. Yes, they'll say your name and they'll say, but Hamdi did. But Hamdi should say, yes, Hamdi did for the sake of Allah. Right? Because just as fast, the people hear it secondary. Allah heard it as soon as you did it. Or Allah knew it before you did it. And, right? So who should we really be worried about? If you want to commit a sin, should the first thing that goes into your mind be, well, what if my parents find out? Should that be the first thing that comes into your mind? The first thing should be, Allah is watching me. Should it be, ah, is Mu'alam around right now? Or should it be, Allah sees me for sure? Should the first thing that comes to your mind before committing sin be, ah, people are going to talk bad about me? Or should the first thing be, Allah knows bad about me? You see the difference? Allah knows bad about me. People will assume bad about me. It's different. That should be the first thing that comes into our mind before we commit a sin. To stop us. Right? So we have to make our deeds sincere for Allah. We have to become sincere for Allah. If we can become sincere, do you know how much we can change ourselves and change our environment? Just from us being sincere, Allah will help us in ways that we could never imagine if we become sincere for the sake of Allah. And then as well, again, we have to turn away our attention from everything else and focus our attention on Allah alone. Establish a salat and give the zakat. Toyyid. The hadith we have, it comes on authority, it says, Haddathana Ismail, Qala Haddathani Malik ibn Anas. عن عمه أبي سهيل بن مالك عن أبيه أنه سمع طلحة بن عبيد الله رضي الله عنه يقول جاء رجل إلى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم من أهل نجد ثائر الرأس يسمع دوي صوته ولا ولا يفقه ما يقول حتى دنا فإذا هو يسأل عن الإسلام فقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم خمس صلوات في اليوم والليلة فقال هل علي غيرها قال لا إلا أن تطوع قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم والصيام رمضان قال هل علي غيره قال لا إلا أن تطوع قال وذكر له رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم الزكاة قال هل علي غيرها قال لا إلا أن تطوع قال فأدبر رجل وهو يقول والله لا أزيد على هذا ولا أنقص قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أفلح إن صدق It's an amazing, 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 amazing hadith An amazing hadith Where a man came to the message of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم He was a Bedouin, right? His hair was all messed up, right? When they say that, or else they're talking about the hair on his head. What's this? Give it to me. Give it to me. Oh, you ripped it? Okay. I know what to do that. Sa'ir or Roxy, right? The hair on his head was all disheveled. It wasn't, you know, Sony just came from Ireland from the bad. He just came from, uh, from the desert. He was a Bedouin. He didn't even have a chance to uh, you know, get himself correct yet. He came straight to the Prophet So he came to the Prophet and asked him about Islam. He said, no, what about Islam? Tell me some things about Islam. So the Prophet explained some things to him about Islam. And he mentioned to him, I forgot. And he mentioned, it says that, that he came 
and he was talking loud, but he was so far away that he couldn't be heard, really. You know that you can tell a person is yelling, but you can't hear what they're saying. And that's what it means, just about what we do. That he came from far away yelling, but you couldn't really understand what is he saying. I don't know what he's saying, but I know he's yelling. You ever heard a person like this? I know they're yelling at me, but what are they saying? That's how far he was coming away. Yelling. Tell me about it. Right? Shows you his, 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 his uh, desire to learn. Where is the messenger? Who knows what he said? Where is the messenger of Allah? Tell me about this. Whatever he said, we don't know, right? But he was yelling from far away. Shows you how his companions, they mentioned these little details to us, right? Finally, when he got closer, they said, we heard him asking about Islam. So the Prophet said, There's five salawat in a day and a night. How many? What are the five salawat in a day and a night? Huh? What are the five salawat in a day and a night? Hamdi. Five salawat in a day and a night, what are they? Huh? Huh? Started off in the right way, from the beginning. <clears throat> I can't hear you. What are they? Maghrib and Isha? How many raka'at is Fajr prayed? Out loud or silent? Huh? It's a good question, right? Especially, it's a very good question for the ladies. Because some of the ladies, they may think that Fajr is prayed silently, but even for the ladies at home, Fajr is prayed two raka'at out loud. Two raka'at out loud. You look amazed. It's silent? I'm not saying you're silent because you look amazed right now. Fajr is two raka out, out loud, even if you're praying by yourself. Even if you're a lady praying at home. Fajr is two raka out, out loud. Right? Are we clear? So that means that you say, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, out loud. You recite your surah out loud. If you missed what? Fajr? Fajr is two raka'at out loud. Fajr is two raka'at out loud. Right? If you miss it, what are you praying? Something besides Fajr or are you praying Fajr? You pray Fajr, right? So Fajr is two raka'at out loud. Tell you? We understand? What's your question? Ask me. Don't ask her. You're talking about something else. Okay, I want to hear it. I, I learned from these type of discussions. What do you? MashaAllah. You ask the Shaykh, he prays out loud, alhamdulillah. So you follow that, right? You know that it's out loud, and that's your proof. Right? It is out loud because my father prays it out loud. How that I will accept that? It's not a proof in Islam, but it's a proof for you. Oh, okay, I'm saying though, it's not a proof in Islam, but it is a proof for you. As a proof to her, because she's your sister. I will praise it out loud, so you better know it's out loud. Good, we accept that. Alhamdulillah. May Allah make us proofs in our houses. <laughs> so, what about Dhuhr? Dhuhr. How many raka'ah? Out loud or silent? Two silent, two out loud? Two out loud and two silent? Dhuhr I'm talking about. Two out loud and two silent, right? You should know me by now, right? They're all silent. Four raka'ah silent, right? There's no out loud silent. There's no out loud in Dhuhr. What about Asr? So it's the same as Dhuhr? Yes. You sure? What about Maghrib? How many raka'ah? Three. Three. How many? What is it? What's the deal with it? Two out loud on one side. What about Isha? Two out loud and two silent. Two out loud and two silent? We sure? What about if you're praying at home? MashaAllah. What about winter? Everybody knows the Tatawa, right? Everybody knows that. It's not really, but that's not obligatory, man. What are you talking about? Everybody knows that thing, right? They said, no, it's not obligatory. 
So, yes. What if you're combining what? Federal and voter. You can't combine federal and voter. There's no way possible that federal and voter can be combined at all. Okay? So listen, hey, back on the page, right? What's the importance about this hadith? What's obligatory from the salat? Those five that we just mentioned. Everything else is going to be from the tatawwa, even witr, even the two raka'at before fajr. The only obligatory salawat that a person has to pray, if they don't, they will be punished if Allah does not forgive them, is what? The five salawat in the day and the night. The ulamaani use this hadith to prove that witr is not an obligation. Because they said if it was an obligation, then the Prophet would have told him, and witr, right? As well, I'll tell you something else, right? Illa and That some of the people they say, is it obligatory for you to complete a voluntary action once you start it? Some of the ulama that use this hadith to say illa and to mean that, except that you also start an act of a voluntary act, right? That if you start to do a voluntary action, then it's wajib, it's wajib that you have to complete it. What does that mean? If you start praying two raka'at of salat, you have to complete it, voluntary. What does it mean? If you start to fast a voluntary salat, that you, I mean, you start to fast a day of voluntary fasting, you have to complete that fast. Do you understand that? Pay attention. That you have to complete it. Is that true? Is a voluntary action that you start is a wajib that you have to complete. question. If you start to do a voluntary day of fasting, is it wajib that you complete the voluntary once you start it? What's your proof? Come forward, come forward. Don't, don't peek. Uh, is it? What's, what are you saying? What is it? What do you have? I don't accept, never mind. Once you start, I want to hear the rest of it. Let's go. Let's go, let's go. No, no, I'm talking to, um, Muna. What is it? She knows my question. She was going to give an answer. It was what? Was what? No, no, no. We, well, I want to hear it. Huh? No, I have not said it's wajib yet. I haven't said it's not wajib either. If it's Monday and you decide to fast, is it wajib that you finish that fast on that Monday? Here, not one proof. Oh, you forgot? Okay. Sorry, what do you have? That was a that was a normal bomb. That was a, that was a, Okay, so listen, that, that's a very good um, thing. I want to bring this up, right? That one time the companions were traveling with the Prophet, وسلم, right? And they were fasting. And he told them, if you want to continue to fast, whoever wants to fast, they can fast. Whoever wants to, they break their fast, right? 
Number one, that was an obligatory fast. That's number one. Number two, they were traveling, so the reason why they're breaking is that no longer is it obligatory to fast if you're traveling, right? Even obligatory, so that's not a proof of this. The reason, number one, is this, right? Some of the scholars that use this as a proof to say illa at the tawah, because the Prophet says illa at the tawah, and they say that illa is mutasil, that is connected, the istithna is connected to the, the, the sin that came before. So he's saying that, that there's nothing, ask the Prophet, is there anything upon me other than those five salawah? He said, no, unless you do it voluntarily. So some scholars, they try to say that this means that if you voluntarily go to do it, you have to complete it. Do you understand? So then he asked him, he told him, he mentioned to him about fasting. And he mentioned to him about zakat. Right? And then he said the same thing. Is there anything else upon me besides that? And he said, no, unless you volunteer to do it. Do you understand? So he's saying that it's obligatory if you volunteer to do it. That's what a group of the scholars said. That is connected. But then, the more correct opinion is that, no, it's not, because the Prophet Sallallahu one time, he entered upon his wife, and she was fasting, right? Juwayri, I believe. And she was fasting on a Friday, and the Prophet Sallallahu he told her she should break her fast. So, it's not wajib that if you start an act of obedience, voluntarily, that you finish. But you should try. But you should, but it's not wise. It takes the same ruling as the act. If the act is voluntary, or if it's mustahab, then it's mustahab that you complete it. Does that make sense? Wallahu ta'ala. So then the man, he continued, he said to the Prophet Wasallam. after that, he turned away. The man, he started to walk away, and he said, Wallahi. I will not increase upon that while I unkus, and I won't go beneath it. Meaning, I'm going to do my, that's what I'm going to do. Do my five salawat, I'm going to pay my zakat, I'm going to fast on my lawn, and that's where I'm chilling at. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, Aflaha in sadaqa, that he will be, he will be successful if he's telling the truth. If he's telling the truth, He will be successful. Why is that? So does that mean for us that you shouldn't make your sunnah? Salawat? Does that mean you shouldn't fast Monday and Thursdays? Does that mean that you shouldn't give extra sadaqah? What does that mean? the bare minimum that we should do so our iman doesn't drop. Anybody else have an answer? The answer returns back to, similar to what he just said, that the asl, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what? The asl in our deen is the fara'id, is the obligations. That's the base, that you have to fulfill your obligations, right? If you're able to fulfill the obligations and not go beneath it, then you're a Muslim, and you've done your job, but you didn't do any overtime, right? You don't get no bonus. You did the job. You can keep your job. You know, we're not going to fire you, but you don't get no bonus. When everybody else gets a bonus, and everybody else is getting paid for overtime, you're just going to get, you did your job. Good job. I don't. But you're not going to get no extra here and take these extra $10, $20 to see your paycheck. Here, take these tickets to go to Darien Lake. You don't get none of that. You get, you did your job. You can keep your job. You did enough. Kafit, kufait. Right? As well, in his statement when he says, Wallahi la azizu ala, it doesn't mean that he won't, that he's gonna do wrong or he's gonna be punished or he's not successful if he goes above it. Nine times out of ten, what happens to a person, if they do their obligations strong, they're gonna go above it. 
They're going to go above it, right? The problem is that most people don't fulfill their obligations properly. Most people don't fulfill the bare minimum. So that's why they go down. But if you establish the bare minimum and you become firm on that, you're going to go up. Your iman is going to increase, inshallah. You're not going to want to stay there. Your love of Allah is going to increase. You think a person who prays five salawat every day on time, gives his zakat, pays the you know, fast from Ramadan, you think he's just going to stay there? No, no, no. He's going to go above it. But even if he doesn't, he does what he was able to do and he stays there. And he's done his job. Does that make sense? So we learn from that. What is the, chap the chapter title that we had was? The Iman increases and decreases. What do we learn from here? That there's levels. Some people's Iman is here. They, they chill. They finish. They, they do their obligations. And it keeps them from going down. Some people, they go up, up, up to the sky. Right? We want to be the people, inshallah, that go up to the sky. We want to be the people, inshallah, that we increase and increase and increase so that we increase also in Jannah. The next hadith. Is a hadith the Prophet in the chapter title is Babun Ittiba Tiba Jana is min al Iman. Following the Jana is following the funeral procession is from Iman. Hajatna Ahmadu bin Abdullah ibn Ali al Manjufiyi. Kala Hajatna Roh, Kala Hajatna Auf. عن الحسن ومحمد عن أبي هريرة رضي الله تعالى عنه أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال من اتبع جنازة مسلم إيمانا واحتسابا وكان معه حتى يصلى عليها ويفرغ, ويفرغ من دفنها فإنه يرجع من الأجر بكيراتين كل كيرات مثل أحد ومن صلى عليها ثم رجع قبل أن تدفن فإنه يرجع بكيرات تابعه عثمان المؤذن قال حدثنا عوف عن محمد عن أبي هريرة عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم نحوه The Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم he said whoever follows the janazah the funeral procession of his Muslim brother or sister right whoever follows it and following the janazah or praying over your brother or sister is from the rights of the Muslim upon the Muslim, right? That if a Muslim dies, we pray over them and we follow their janazah until they're buried. Or we try to, as much as we're able to. It's a huge reward. It's a huge reward. So the Prophet said, he said, whoever follows the janazah of a Muslim out of Iman, وَحْتِسَابًا and hoping for a reward, out of Iman that this is obligatory, out of Iman that Allah is happy with this. Wahtisabin, hoping for a reward, not just going because that's my brother from my same tribe. Right? He's from my people, so I went. No, nobody cares. We gotta remember all that stuff is superficial. He's from my people, he's from this. No, you're going Imanan Wahtisabin. Out of Iman that this is a Muslim that died and this is right. Wahtisabin, hoping for a reward from Allah. Right? Whoever goes with that on their mind, the Messenger of Allah says, And he's with them until they pray over him. And until after he is buried in the grave, he's actually put in the grave and the dirt is poured over him. He returns with two kirat worth of reward. And every kirat is like the size of Mount Uhud. Every kirat is like the size of Mount Uhud. Does anybody know how big Mount Uhud is? It's a big mountain. It's an actual mountain, not a hill. A mountain, right? Huge mountain. When you see it in the, uh, outside of Medina, like, whoa, that's Uhud. This is a, it's clear. It's not like, you know, some, on the promise of mentioned something to them that they see. It's not like, a, like our mountains are here. Sometimes they're grass over. You can't really tell how big they really are, right? Because the mountain is clear. You can see, well, that's, oh, wow, that's a, that's a lot of reward to get. 
a kirat worth of reward, or two kirat if you stayed until he was buried. She said, every kirat is worth is like uhud. Well, whoever prays, and he said, well, alayha, and whoever just prays over him, then he returns, they'll get one kirat. He leaves before the person is buried. And he gets one kirat. And that's a lot too. The benefit or the point of this hadith is that the person that followed the janazah is from Iman, and again, that shows us why it's put in this chapter, or it's put in this book. Stop now, Sean. All right, what's, the, what's today? What, what's today's date? 20th, I believe. Today's the 20th? So how, what, what, what week? What, 20th? The month is over. So, mm -hmm. so we have two more classes, I think? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Seven. Yeah, two. 27 and the third, right? No. Let me see something. No, we're not going to stop it. I want to try to finish this book before we go for Hajj Shah. Okay. Ah, uh, no. So much knowledge. He's killing us with the It's like you have a gun filled with ilm. Boom. <laughs> 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 Don't shoot me no more, please. Too much ilm for one day. This is the easy I had. What? What happened? Tired? Keep going, right? Inshallah. They say keep going, Sheikh Shahid. <laughs> I'm playing that. Tired. Get back focused, Abdul Rahman. We're back. We're not stopping. We're going to keep going. Inshallah. Tired. Babu. This is an important chapter, so everyone please pay attention, seriously. Babu. Khawful mu'min min an yahbata amaluhu wa huwa la yash'ur. The chapter of. A believer, the believer has fear that he will, his actions will be wiped away and he doesn't even know it. The believer is scared, has fear that he'll be, his actions, the good that he's done in the past will be wiped away and he doesn't even know it. He's not even aware of it, not paying attention. He got caught slipping, right? What did I say? Lacking. He got caught lacking, right? Don't get caught lacking. That's right. Seriously. That's how we should be over our iman. Don't get caught lacking and your iman goes away. Your actions are wiped out. So that happens. The first thing we have to realize is that can happen. Right? The first thing that we have to put in our minds so we see how dangerous it is that it can happen that your iman, your actions get wiped away and you don't even realize it. You think that you're good and all the good deeds that you did got wiped away. Put that in your mind. Think about that. Then if you think about that, you should know what are the things that can cause that to happen to you. That's what this chapter is going to deal with. What are those things that can cause your iman to be wiped away and you not even realize it. Is that something to be scared of? Who here wants to die thinking that they have good deeds? Right? Thinking that they have good deeds and when they get on Yom Al-Qiyamah, they get called their Muflis. You know what a Muflis is? Does anyone know what a Muflis is? It's a very important title. Some of us may be Muflis right now and don't even realize it. The prophet said to me, asked the companion, do you know who the Muflis is? So they said, I mean, they know what it meant linguistically. Muflis linguistically means the one who has no money. He's bankrupt. He's broke. Right? They said, yo, man, let me hold a dollar. I don't even have a dollar. 
right? Some, anybody here broke like that? MashaAllah, may Allah give you what you need of good. We have nothing for you. <laughs> so the, the Muflis is the one who's bankrupt. Now literally, think about it. Imagine living in this world. You're not broke. You know why you're not broke? You have a situation. You're not having a dollar. It doesn't matter. Because you're still going to eat today, right? You still have a roof over your head because you don't pay no bills. You might even have a phone and don't pay the bill for that, right? So you can't be muflis. You're no, you don't have to worry about being bankrupt unless your family becomes bankrupt. Then you worry. But you see your sisters go to work, mother go to work, you say, I'm good. I just go to masjid and get my study on. Alhamdulillah. Stressful, stressless life. Alhamdulillah. Some of us who have responsibility, if we say we don't have a dollar, it's a problem. People are going to be looking at us like, what do you mean you don't have a dollar? You don't have a dollar? I don't have a dollar. Uh, how's this going to work? Well, I haven't figured that part out yet. That's the person to be afraid. That's what you got to really think about as a man, as an adult. When you get told about you don't have a dollar, you're bankrupt, that's something to be worried about. Right? In this dunya, you may ask Allah for some more help. So the muflis on Yom Al-Qiyamah is what? That's the first thing is to put it into the dunya understanding. That if you're a muflis, you don't have no money. You can't eat, can't go buy no chips at the store. You don't have nothing. Bankrupt. Can't go buy a bottle of water. What does it mean on Yom Al-Qiyamah? No. He had good deeds. A person will come on Yom Al-Qiyamah with mountains worth of good deeds. He had a lot of money. A lot of good deeds. But he or she backbited. He or she made namima. You know namima? Lied and slandered people. He or she punched people. Talked bad about people. Oppressed people, right? Made dhulm. So on Yom Al-Qiyama, everyone that they did wrong to will come and take from their good. Let me get some of that. Oh, you made hajj? Let me get that. Oh, you made Let me get that. Oh, you fasted 20 years worth of Ramadan? That looks nice. Let me get that. Right? Oh, what's that? You gave a million dollars in sadaqah? I can use that. Let me get that. Till there's nothing left. Till there's nothing left. Oh. Till there's nothing left. Now you imagine you come to Yom County and say, I'm good. Look at all that good deeds I got right there. MashaAllah, I'm getting an agenda. And then Allah brings the account. And everyone you did wrong to comes. Everyone you talk bad about, everyone you lied against, everyone you curse, everyone you hit, everyone you spit on, everyone you, whatever you did wrong, comes and says, let me get that from you. Man, you did all this good just for me to come get it on Yom Al-Qiyama? MashaAllah, you're so nice. Right? Then you won't have nothing left. The Prophet says, that's the muflis. And then what happens when you don't have nothing left? You have nothing else to give. What happens then? They give you their bad deeds. SubhanAllah. Who wants that? That you now have to sit there while everyone pours their bad, their lies, their stealing, their murder, their zinat. They give it to you. And you're like, man, where? Oh, oh Allah. The rights of people. That's how we learn how important the rights of people are. And we treat it like it's nothing. But the rights of people will make you, who thought you were up here, you thought you were on Mount Uhud, you go under the earth because you didn't value the honor of the Muslims. You treated the honor of the Muslims as if it was nothing. That same person that you was like, oh, look, he's smoking crack. Ain't he a Muslim? And you talking bad about him and stuff. Now all his crack smoking becomes your good de your deeds. Now you a crackhead on your Mufiyama. Right? On Yom Al-Qiyamah now, you're the crackhead. You got all the deeds of the crackhead. Because you couldn't honor. I'm not just saying, you know, hopefully nobody smokes crack. But I'm just giving an example. We have to be careful about what we do to the Muslims. We have to be careful about what we say about the Muslims. Right? Imagine SubhanAllah. Kill it. That's not a big deal. A spider. I don't know how some of you used to live in Africa. 
spider and you guys go crazy. Scorpions running around, you guys are worried about a spider. <coughs> America makes us weak, man. <laughs> People used to walk miles with no shoes on. It's kind of love, man. Allah make it easy for us. So, going back to the situation, that's one type of person whose deeds can be wiped away and they don't even realize it, right? But we're going to deal with more, inshallah. So the chapter goes in and says, We'll call it Ibrahim at Taymi. Ibrahim, he said, مَا عَرَبْتُ قَوْلِ عَلَىٰ عَمَلِ إِلَّا خَشِيْتُ أَنْ أَكُونَ مُكَذِّبًا So this is the first statement of one of our salaf. Ibrahim al-Taymi radiallahu rahimahullah ta'ala He said, I never عَرَبْتُ قَوْلِ عَلَىٰ عَمَلِ He said, whenever I this is like, um expose my good deed or expose what I said or uh, it's a word I'm looking for I can't understand like yeah, but, yeah, but Arato doesn't mean here like it means it's like um, Arato here means like when you like put something up for examination I, don't, I can't think of the word what it means in English like but when I, I get a good way to say it in English be when I write away my statements or whenever I put my statements up against my actions like, I said this, and I make it in front of, I, what I said, I put whatever I said in front of what I actually did. Whenever I put whatever I say I'm going to do, or whatever I talk about doing, in front of what I actually did, I'm always afraid that I'll be a liar. You understand that? I have to call it whenever I expose my statement to what I actually did. Or I present my statement, that's a better word. Whenever I present my statement in front of what I actually did, I'm always afraid that I'm going to be alive. How many people that say, oh, you know, what does this mean? The person says, all the tongue service is easy. People say, la ilaha illallah. There's nothing that deserves to be worshipped except for Allah, but they worship money. Right? They worship themselves. Right? They say, oh, how many times people say, well, I only fear Allah. I don't fear nothing but Allah. I say, really? Why you still don't wear your hijab properly? Who you fear? Right? Oh, really? Why you don't grow your beard? Why you don't wear a thobe? You say, I don't fear. How many people you see this, right? They say, I fear nothing but Allah. So, so when we say things sometimes, if we really put what we say in accordance with what we do, it doesn't add up most of the time. Most of the time, it doesn't add up. But how many of us are that honest with ourselves? This salaf, this man from the salaf was honest to himself. He said that whenever I do it, I'm always afraid that I'm going to be a liar. But do we do this? Do we weigh what we say in accordance with what we actually do? Do we take that time to reflect upon ourselves like that? Man, didn't I say, or how, many how much Quran do I know that I read every day? How much of it do I apply? That's a statement. I'm reading the Quran, right? I'm saying what Allah has told me to say. And in the Quran, it become a hujja alayna. The Quran has become a proof against us. Why? We're reading it, reading it. How much of it does our actions coincide with? He said, I amali. I never used to put my statements in, or spoke, present my statements in front of my actions. Except that I used to be afraid, hey, I'm scared that I'll be considered myself a liar. Not nobody else. That's what we gotta remember. He's not talking about anyone else. He said, I fear that I will consider myself a liar. Forget worrying about anybody else. Don't worry about nobody else. What people are going to think about me. I fear that I myself will be considered a liar. So I got a lot of talk. Everybody has a lot of talk. What are they going to do? They're not going to pop a grape in a fruit fight, right? But everybody told me what they're going to do if they had a chance. If I had a chance, I would do something. Like, I'm not going to do nothing. What are you doing right now? Everybody's talking about what everybody else is supposed to be or not doing. Oh, if I had a million dollars, I'd be giving all of it in Southern here. Sounds good. If you had a million dollars, you'd probably be driving a Bentley, poor, all of them at the same time. But everybody has to talk about what everyone else is doing. If I had the time they had, I'd be, no, you don't know what you'll be doing. Shut your mouth, 
and do more actions. Be quiet. Remember the Sheikh Abu Tobi told us recently, told me and Harun Al Fasha. He said, one thing that a person has to do, learn this, it's a principle. That how do you make yourself change? How do you become better? It's a rule for how to become better. How do you become better? I'm asking you guys a question. Learn that much so you can practical in your Ooh, life. Learning sometimes makes you <laughs> work. <laughs> Sometimes people become worse because they learn too much and they don't do nothing. Yeah, learn that much so you can practical it in your life. Right? Oh, only, oh, oh, learn only enough so that you can do it. Yeah. No, but you want to learn. The Prophet was told, told to Allah, "Kul what? Rabbi zidni ilma." That's the only time the Prophet was ever told to ask Allah for more of something, and it was knowledge. So we should always want more knowledge, but we also need more action. But now he said the rule is this, Asma, right? How do you do it? Make a, tell yourself that I want to start doing something, right? I want to read more Quran every day. But don't tell nobody else. This is just between you and yourself. I'm going to read five pages of Quran every day. Of course, you should be doing more than that, right? But I'm going to read five pages of Quran every day. And don't tell anyone. And I'm going to do this for two weeks. And at the end of those two weeks, Make a little prize for yourself. You say, oh, I'm going to buy myself something I like. Right? But don't, something small, but don't tell me. Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. Shada Allah, 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 Allah. Shada Allah. self-improvement is the self to do self-improvement. That if you want to do something, right? You want to make a change in your life? Practice it first, right? But don't tell anyone that you're working on that. Because then what it helps you do it builds your self-confidence. That when you did it, you say, wow, man, alhamdulillah, I was able to finish that. Right? But if you don't finish it and you told everybody, they're going to be like, oh, didn't you say you was working on doing such and such? Then you, you lose self-confidence because you're like, ah, oh, man, yeah, I didn't finish it. So to build your self-confidence and to do it properly, don't tell anybody. Just do it and then reward yourself. Give yourself a little prize and don't tell anybody about that either. Like, some of you should say, I'm not going to talk in class anymore. Right? I'm going to come to class and I'm just going to be serious. And if you're able to accomplish that, reward yourself a little bit at the end of two, three weeks. That's a good goal for some of you to have. I'm going to come to class, I'm not going to talk. And just work on it. Don't tell nobody. Don't tell your friends, like, let's work on it together. Just do it yourself to build your own self-confidence. And you'll save yourself from a lot of trouble, too. Because it can get real ugly. Right? Talking in class can get real ugly, right? Yes, it can. Then, Ibn Abi Mulaika, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, أَدْرَكْتُ ثَلَاثِينَ مِنْ أَصْحَابِ النَّبِيِّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمْ كُلُّهُمْ يَخَافُ النِّفَاقَ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ مَا مِنْهُمْ أَحَدٌ يَقُولْ إِنَّهُ عَلَى إِمَانِ جِبْرِيلَ وَمِيْكَائِيلَ وَيُذْكَرُ عَنِ الْحَسِنِ Okay, now. Ibn Abi Mulaika, he said, I met 30 companions of the Prophet 
How many is that? It's not one or two. This means a lot of them. He meant 30 of them. He said, Kullu whom you have, every single one of them feared that they would be a hypocrite. These are companions of the prophet, people who fought with the prophet, saw the prophet, saw his miracles, and they feared that they would be hypocrites. What about us? We live our lives like everything is good, like I'm just the best Muslim, nobody can tell me nothing. I don't have no fear. 30 companions of the Prophet each one of them feared that they would be a hypocrite. And not one of them used to say that my Imam is like Jibreel and Mikhail. I have Imam like the angel. They know what? Imam goes up and it goes down. So much so that we all know the story of Hanwalah, right? We don't know the story of Hanwalah? Hanwalah radiallahu anhu, one time he was with he was with his family. He was chilling, relaxing with his family. And he, he had a strong earth hole. He said, whoa, Hanbal is a hypocrite. Look what he said, it's a companion. He said, I have become a hypocrite. So he ran out of his house. Ooh, I gotta go see the prophet and sell him. And when he ran out of his house, who did he meet on the road? No. Who did he meet on the road? Who did he meet on the road? He met Abu Bakr. He said, I, I, and Abu Bakr said, Hanbal, what's happening? Where are you going? Looking like, you, what's going on? He said, yeah, Abu Bakr, I became a hypocrite. He said, whoa, what are you talking about, Hanbal? He said, what do you mean? He said, because whenever I'm with the prophet, so I said, my iman is up in the skies, right? So my iman is high. But whenever I'm with my family and my children, I'm playing with them and things are happening, and my iman is not the same. So Abu Bakr said, whoa, that happens to you? I'm a hypocrite too. Abu Bakr, a Siddiq said, well, I'm a hypocrite too. So they ran to the prophet, so I said, both of them. Ya Rasulullah, we are hypocrites. Why? Because when we're with you, our iman is like we can see Jannah. And when we go with our families, it goes down. So the prophet, so I said, he said to, him, to them both, if your iman would stay like that, high when you're with me, then the angels will come down and shake your hands. But, there's a time for this, and there's a time for that. Nobody's imagined is going to stay like that. But the companions, they were worried over themselves. You understand that? They had fear about what they were doing. And these were the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Omar radiallahu anhu. What happened with Omar? Omar radiallahu anhu. He came to Hudayfa, and Hudayfa was called the keeper of the secrets of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told Hudayfa the names of all the Munafiqeen. And he came to, and Omar, he knew this. So he came to Hudayfa one time and said, Hudayfa. He said, Hudayfa, do you know if the Prophet ﷺ mentioned me amongst the hypocrites? Look at this question. This is Umar ibn al-Khattab, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He came to the Prophet ﷺ and he asked, the, I'm excuse me, he came to Hudayfa, radiallahu anhu. And he said, did the Prophet ﷺ mention me, Umar, amongst the hypocrites? You see how they work? And Hudayfa told no. He said, Allah Zaki Ahad and I don't glorify anyone, right? Or purify anyone. But he didn't mention you. Yeah. Right? You're not from amongst them. Not you. So we learn from that, we pick up from that situation what? That the companions were afraid of being munafiqeen. What about us in 1440 after Hijra, Dhul Ka'da? Right? With all the sins that are on our backs. Right? Shouldn't we be worried about being a hypocrite? Shouldn't we be worried about not doing enough to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Should any of us feel like we've made it? We got a bitaka, a card saying that I'm going to Jannah, I don't gotta do nothing else, right? I'm good, I made it. None of us have that, right? So we should be more afraid than them. These people have deeds that we can't even imagine of good. We should be more worried about ourselves than they are. Because maybe some of us are hypocrites. Maybe some of us, and this is the hypocrite, the type of hypocrite of what? Inshallah, not in the fact i'tiqali, but the fact amali, the fact of actions, right? That I'm not doing, I say one thing, but I don't do it. I read the Quran, but I'm not applying it. I know the Sunnah, but I'm not applying it. All of us here know enough of our deen that maybe we're not applying it. We're not doing it the way that we know we should be doing it. So we have to do more. We have to strive harder. Then, 
الحسن البصري رحمه الله تعالى سما خاف إلا مؤمن ولا أمنه إلا منافق وما يحذر من الإصرار على النفاق والعصيان من غير توبة لقوله الله تعالى ولم يصر على ما فعلوا وهم يعلمون الحسن البصري رحمه الله تعالى he said no one fears nifaq except for a believer and no one feels safe from it except for actual munafiq so if you don't fear hypocrisy you don't fear when you stand up sometimes that maybe I'm doing this for the people you don't fear this then maybe you are a hypocrite the believer fears it that am I doing this for the sake of Allah am I doing this or seeking to get pleasure from Allah or am I doing this because it's what my people do with everybody, I don't know nothing else. My culture. If I, if you Muslim by culture, you have a problem. That means you haven't submitted wholeheartedly yourself to Islam. So Hassan al Basri, rahimahullah taala, he said, "No one fears hypocrisy except the believer, and no one feels safe from it. Like they just live their life. I'm just living a happy Muslim life. I don't have no fear, except for Munafiq." And a person, and they will never, the gunafic will never, will not be afraid, will not be cautioned from doing the same sin over and over, being persistent and arrogant on a sin. Israel is when you stubbornly reject to get off that sin. You know it's a sin. People are telling you, don't do that. So you're like, listen, I'm still going to do this. And you don't have no fear. No toba, no istighfar. The only one who does like that is a munafiq. Why? Because Allah described the believer as They don't continue stubbornly on doing the same thing while they know. Without no toba, nothing. They just continue to move forward in that manner. How that? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Actually, let's keep going. With it. Hadathana, this is the last hadith, don't worry. Hadathana Muhammad ibn Ar'ara Qala hadathana Shu'ba an Zubayd Qala sa'altu Aba Wa'ilin an al-Murji'ah Faqala hadathani Abdullah an al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Qala sibab al-Muslimi fasuq wa kitalahu kufr Abu Wa'il And he died 99 after Hijra, something like this. All right, I could be mistaken, I'm not remembering correctly. But the point is that he died a long time ago. Right? The point is, this bid'ah of irja is old. And what's the way that we say irja is? That a person says, my iman is in my heart, don't worry about what I'm doing. I'm a believer. And this is something that's prevalent today. It's not like Irujah, it's, like it's not an old bid'ah that died out. It's a bid'ah that the Muslims are still doing today. And it's old. Right? People today, they still will come and say, Akhi, don't tell me that. Man, I, Iman is in my heart. You don't know, I'm a believer. You don't know me. I remember I, just a couple days ago, I was talking to some brothers. They were on the corner smoking Spike. Right? Literally smoking Spike. Spike. Muslim. And he said, nah, Akhi, you don't know me like that. You know, like, you don't know. I'm a Muslim and I know what I'm doing. The spike in your hand right now, and you light it, and he's he gonna tell me, tell me, I'm not gonna light it right now because you're here. I said, but doesn't your body have the same rights on it that mine does? What's more honorable about my body than your body? So you want to save my body from smelling the spike, but you don't care about yours. But Allah gave you your body just like He gave it to me. So he said, Nah, you don't know me. I'm a grown man. Grown men don't go to the fire? You know, some honest reality that we have, this mindset. Uh, grown women don't go to the fire. How many people say, I'm an adult. You can't tell me nothing. I know my iman. It's in my heart. This is in a People don't realize. This whole chapter, this whole book that we're going over is about that title. That a person feeling like, my iman is in my heart. I'm going to do what I want to do. So, Abu Wa'il, he was asked about al murujiah the people who have this type of belief, that regardless of what I do, I'm still a perfect believer. You understand? I can do whatever I want. I'm a perfect believer. Don't talk to me about what I'm wearing. How many people you see, they say that. 
Mind your business. Don't care. Why are you worried about what I'm wearing? Right? Is that something you guys hear before? Mind your business. I got a boyfriend, so what? I got a girlfriend, so what? It's not your business. I'm still a perfect believer in my heart. I say, yeah, really? So we can do that now. No. So what did Abu Wa'ala say? Look at the thick of the, of the setup. He didn't debate with him. He didn't talk with him. He said, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Sibab al-Muslim fusuq wa kitaluhu kufr. You see, do you understand what the point is in that hadith? Anybody catch it? Nobody caught it, right? Oh, I didn't, I didn't translate it. <laughs> he said, cursing a believer is fusuq. Fusuq is bigger than just sin, fisk. And they said that fisk is more severe than regular sin. And fighting a believer, or fighting a Muslim, or cursing a Muslim is a big sin, right? And fighting him is kufr, is disbelief. What's the point of Abu Wa'al mentioning that hadith? Anybody know? I mean, it's creating more facade? Yeah, it does. Well, there's a point in him mentioning that hadith when the person came to ask him about the murjia. They came to ask him about people who say, my iman is in my heart. Don't bother me. I have perfect iman like the angels, even though I commit sins. What was the point of him mentioning this narration as a proof? Very easy, right? We don't have to. The, the, the problem with today is people make things so difficult. Look how easy this, the, the, the setup used to respond. If you fight, if you curse a Muslim, the Prophet said it's fusuk. And fusuk is a sin. If it's a sin, it means you're what? Iman is going down. And he was described as being fusuk. That if you do it, you're a fasik, meaning that you're a sinner, not a complete believer. And if you fight them, it's kufr. Again, showing that actions have an effect on our iman. If we do certain actions, it'll make our iman go down. And if we do other actions, it makes our iman go up. Actions have an effect on our iman. Very simple, right? Tayyip, any questions? I went over because, again, I want to try to finish this before um, Hajj time, inshallah. So. We will. We went a little further. I think we should be done. We should be able to finish it, inshallah. There's, there's not a lot left. It's uh, how many more hadith left? Forty. Oh, it's only six, uh, eight hadith left. So we have two more classes. We should be able to finish it, inshallah. Tayyib. Hada wa sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Subhanakallahumma bihamdika. Shalom la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa tubu ilayk.